Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Danger in the Backcountry. It's great to have all of you here today. You know, the untouched pillows of snow are a magnet for skiers and snowboarders. Across the continent, skiers and riders are finding their way into the backcountry in skyrocketing numbers. In the past three years, sales of backcountry gear have more than doubled, and that was before the pandemic. This hour-long panel will explore both the joys and the dangers of traveling in the backcountry. How can you travel in the backcountry safely? What is the avalanche danger and how can it be predicted? What equipment is essential? How do you keep from getting injured and how do you manage injuries in the backcountry? There's a myriad of different topics. I wanna to thank the North American Snow Sports Journalist for its partnership of this event tonight. Uh, we're great to have you here and have so many journalists joining us along with the many avalanche professionals and just backcountry skiers and snowboarders who are joining us here this evening. To kick things off, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce a, a longtime colleague. Uh, Jeff Blumenfeld is the president of the North American Snow Sports Journalist and please welcome him for a short introduction. Jeff. Thanks, Tom, and uh, welcome to all of you. And thank you, Tom, again, for pulling together this impressive panel of um, experts. I know here in Colorado, interest in the backcountry, it, it's huge, especially considering new COVID protocols that involve advanced parking reservations and or, and or ticket reservations at many resorts. These new rules can be confusing, which is where NASJA comes in. We're the North American Snow Sports Journalists Association. It's a professional group of 180 press and corporate members. We started almost 60 years ago. You can see us online at nasja.org. Our press members include writers and photographers and broadcasters and vloggers and videographers, influencers, some of the top uh, ski columnists in North America. These are people who report on skiing and snowboarding and fat biking and racing and Nordic related news and information and features in a variety of media outlets. And our corporate members include ski resorts and associations such as SIA, you'll hear from Nick shortly, um, and tour operators in the US and Canada. So together, NASHI is working to help skiers and riders decide the best gear to buy, uh, where to go, uh, what to wear, how to stay comfortable, and, and how to remain safe this season. And this webinar, is part of that effort. And we hope you gain lots of additional knowledge and how to better enjoy, oh God, to better enjoy this crazy season and the, and the more normal ones we're all looking forward to in the future. So if you're a snow sports journalist or are involved in the ski business, look us up, nasja.org. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much, Jeff. And next, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Steve Burlack. Steve is a longtime ski coach. And in 2015, uh, his son, Ronnie, was one of two US ski team athletes killed in an avalanche. He was really one of the visionaries for brass. And to say a few words of welcome, please join me in welcoming Steve Burlack. Steve? Uh, thanks a lot, Tom. Um, currently nestled here in Franconia, New Hampshire. Uh, as Tom mentioned, I coach men's Fis Alpine skiing at Burke Mountain Academy in East Burke, Vermont. Uh, we just returned Monday from a three-week on-snow camp at Copper Mountain. Looking forward to similar conditions here in the East soon. And it is my privilege as the chairman of the Brass Foundation to welcome all the attendees here this evening engaging in this important discussion of danger in the backcountry. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and now I want to introduce our panel and just bear with me for just a second while I bring them onto the screen. Okay, I think I have everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, you have met Steve Burlack already. Next up, it's my pleasure to introduce 
Mark Staples. Mark is with the U.S. Forest Service working together with the Utah Avalanche Center. He'll be talking to us about the efforts of Utah Avalanche Center as well as its nationally recognized program, Know Before You Go. Mark, you want to unmute there? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tom. My name is Mark Staples. I'm the director of the Utah Avalanche Center. Uh, we're here in Salt Lake City. We cover the whole state of Utah with uh, forecasting, education, and awareness programs. Okay, and next up, my pleasure to introduce Nick Sargent. Nick is the president and CEO of Snow Sports Industries America, the trade organization for the equipment industry and retailers in America. Nick, welcome to the panel. Thanks, hey, Tom. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with this group, and uh, hopefully, we're gonna we're gonna learn a lot about safety tonight. But most importantly, I'm looking forward to sharing you, uh, sharing with you some numbers on how backcountry, uh, the business of backcountry is performing, and uh, and then we'll also get into some of the specifics about the product and how that product is moving at retail as well. So we're looking forward to sharing that with you. Thank you very much, Nick. And finally, uh, Matthew Smith. He is a backcountry training expert and a flight paramedic up in uh, uh, the BC area. Matt, welcome to the panel. Hello, folks. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, allowing me to be here. And uh, like you mentioned, I live in Squamish, British Columbia, and I'm a critical care flight paramedic here in British Columbia, specializing in pediatric critical care. Hey, thank you very much for joining us, Matt. I want to first of all start out uh, tonight and uh, talk a little bit uh, more in detail about what each of your specific roles are with your organization. And Steve, why don't you start it out and let's talk a little bit more about what you do and what Brass does. Thanks, Tom. Uh, the founding principles of the Brass Foundation, in addition to memorializing the lives of two exceptional young men and ski racers, was to recognize the lack of knowledge and vulnerability we have for snow safety when venturing off the prepared slopes and to create and provide easily accessible snow safety education for the outdoor enthusiast. As you will read in the accident report on our website, the entire US ski team group, coaches, athletes, and trainers were woefully unprepared to manage the snow conditions that led to that tragic day in January, 2015. Brass has been fortunate to have the unbridled support of generous donors, US Ski and Snowboard, Snow Sports Industries America, National Ski Areas Association, plus many other snow safety training organizations and avalanche mitigation equipment manufacturers, both here and in Europe. Where do we sit currently? Well, we are a fit and adventurous population. The gear available for backcountry, side country, and ski mountaineering is amazing, and the two create a dangerous combination in the absence of education and training for safely enjoying off piece skiing. The pandemic has supercharged our concerns as people equate proper social distancing with outdoor activity. You may indeed be safer outside than sitting in a ski lodge, but a whole cadre of objective dangers awaits you in the backcountry. We have seen this all summer here in the White Mountains. Trailhead parking is packed by 6 a.m. Overflow parking is teeming down the road. Hikers with limited ability, knowledge, and equipment are stressing out safety service personnel as they call for help. It is not going to be any less of a concern and only more difficult this winter. A simple viewing of the Brass Off-Piece video, taking an online e-learning module from US Ski and Snowboard or other providers, or attending a Brass 101 webinar will keep you alive. I have said many times while presenting to groups of athletes, and their families had the simple know before you go trifold brochure been in the seat back pockets of that flight to Europe in January 2015, Ronnie and Bryce would probably be alive today. Be safe out there and back to you, Tom. Great, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and having had the honor of working for Brass over the last few years, uh, it was a great tragedy in 2015, but coming out of it has been a greater push for education, especially across uh, racing clubs in America. Next up now, Nick Sargent. Nick, uh, we've known you in a variety of roles in your career, and right now you're heading up the equipment industry, uh, Trade Association of America. Talk a little bit more about what your role is in this topic. 
Sure, thanks, Tom. Uh, so we are, we're a 65 year old trade organization. We represent the interest of the winter sport business 12 months a year. And that business doesn't stop in, in March or April. And uh, it obviously continues straight through the summer and into the fall when most of our members are, are looking for the tools that we, that we provide. We have over 700 winter sport members. You name an outdoor winter brand, uh, they most likely are our member. And uh, there's still a few that aren't, but uh, majority of all brands are. We focus on six different pillars. And these pillars are designed to help all of those members through the busy, uh, uh, busy seasons and uh, all the issues that pop up, whether it be advocacy, which is uniting the winter community to take meaningful action on climate change or tariffs. Those are very important elements to the overall wholesale business of, uh, of winter sport, but also what's important to the supplier as they're the ones designing and making that product. Clearly snow is important to all of us. Without it, we have no industry. So we're working hard there. Consumers is another area that we're spending a lot of time in fo focusing invaluable and direct uh, work and access to those outdoor enthusiasts and their insights and habits and trends. We can take that information, we can boil it down into research and data, and we can help our industry make good decisions around who's buying that product. Education, this is, this is the part that it gets really exciting and fun for us. Uh, so we're here to help businesses uh, grow and support their business with the appropriate tools uh, to educate them, whether it be through e-com, whether it be through um, avalanche, uh, whether it be through mountain guides, whether it be through um, ski racing, where a lot of my, uh, my time is spent um, out, of, out of the office. But those are valuable tools that are going to help our members grow their business. And again, whether you're a retailer, whether you're a rep, whether you're a resort or you're a supplier, we create those tools to make, um, uh, make you and your business thrive. Inclusion is a new area that we're focusing on. We're charting a path forward with inclusion in the winter outdoor um, industry. And we're committed to this and uh, we're here to um, help create positive industry change. That inc includes very strong and frank conversations with our membership, uh, ensuring that everyone has a chance to get involved uh, in winter sports. Insights is another very crucial um, action that we focus on. This is where we take actionable consumer retail and participation data, and we help uh, our uh, members create better and more informed business decisions as they are creating product or they're selling products into the wholesale and retail channel. Last is participation. Uh, the funnel is shrinking as we, we, we all know, and we talk about this frequently. We're here to help put more participants in that funnel and grow the industry to ensure a long, healthy, um, and vibrant ecosystem um, in the winter sports that we love so much. So that's just a little bit about what we're up to, but back to you, Tom. Just one follow-up question, Nick. I know we look at you as a trade association, but you're also starting to do a little bit more direct to consumer communications. You talked a little bit on that, but can you just expound on that just a little bit? We, we've been, uh, SI has been involved in trade shows since the inception. We sold our largest trade show just a few years ago, and we, we turned our focus from a B2B platform to a B2C platform, but basically going from a trade show organization to a natural trade association. And as part of that, we bought uh, the, the longstanding BWE consumer shows. We've rebranded them Snowbound. You can find information there on snowboundfest.com. And that's where we're introducing consumers to the suppliers and the suppliers to the consumers to learn more of when and the where and the how the consumers buy and, uh, and look for gear, but also gives our suppliers and retailers a way to speak directly to the consumer. Great, Thank you. thanks very much. Uh, next on to you, Mark Staples. Uh, you are with the U.S. Forest Service working together with Utah Avalanche Center. I know that you're right on the cusp of your season. It has snowed a lot out in Utah already. Ready? Tell us a little bit about your role and how you help to make the backcountry safe for skiers and riders. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, you know, the big thing we do is we provide avalanche forecasting, like centers around the country. And that is the, the goal there is to provide 
information and edu uh, well information for people before they head out so they know what to expect. Uh, we also provide education and awareness. Uh, mainly, we get people started on the path to education, and and on the awareness side, that's uh, that's less teaching people what to do or how to do, but just making them aware of, of what's going on out there and, and just getting them started. Uh, our flagship program, which started in 2004, after uh, three young boys died uh, down near Mount Timpanogos in a large avalanche, is the Know Before You Go program. And that's something uh, that's expanded across the country. Uh, the Colorado Avalanche Information Center is doing it. Uh, places around the world are doing it. We've translated it into a few different languages. Um, through some of that work, we were able to branch off and then do a lot of the work producing some of the videos and other content for the Brass Foundation. Uh, that was really the beginnings of a lot of that. And um, ultimately, though, our goal and our mission is to save lives. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. And Matt, we're going to go up to Canada now. Uh, uh, you live in a beautiful region, a region that is blessed with great snowfall and also great challenges in the backcountry. Talk a little bit about your role in making the backcountry safe. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, so wear a lot of different hats. My primary role is working as a critical care flight paramedic with BC Ambulance, working right now specifically in pediatric critical care. So responding to any number of incidents. Um, I also work as a ski patrol, been a ski patrol quite a few different places around Canada over the last 20 years. Last season, I was at Whistler Blackholm. Um, but my real passion is education, and it's uh, great to chat with some of the other gentlemen here about education. And I wear a number of hats in education as well. I've taught outdoor education, sort of leave no, chase, leave no trace training, and hopefully we'll get a, a brief second to talk about that a little later on. But primarily right now, I'm teaching wilderness first aid courses and helping my wife, who's uh, purchased a company that teaches outdoor emergency care or ski patrol, the OEC training. So um, my passion is sort of from the training angle, really trying to encourage people to take uh, to take steps to take technical training. We'll talk about avalanche training uh, a little later on, I think, but also to take training in what to do when it what to do after where an incident happens. So take a proper wilderness first aid course. Um, so working with uh, two different organizations, Canadian North Medical Consulting and the Pacific Alpine Institute in, in really encouraging people to take proper um, to take proper training in first aid and accident pre incident prevention, not just technical training. Um, Matt, I want to stay with you for a minute and uh, start with you and then go to Mark. Uh, Absolutely. You, you are you, the, the two of you are directly involved in the front line of education. And we have this situation right now where sales of backcountry gear are escalating. People are heading to the backcountry as an alternative to going to the resorts during the pandemic. Uh, and it's getting crowded out there. Why is education needed? It seems like a simple question, but it's one that a lot of people maybe don't think of when they buy that pair of backcountry skis. Absolutely. And I think, uh, the next slide sort of speaks to that. Um, I, it's a really great question. I think it's questions that a lot of people don't really think about. And that's because the backcountry is unforgiving. Um, and it lacks the infrastructure that front country, front country settings have. So people are used to interacting with, with the wilderness in a park setting or at a, at a ski resort, where there's ski patrol, there's parking lots, there's concessions, all that sort, sort of stuff. It doesn't take much, especially here in the sea to sky, to be out in real wilderness, just duck a boundary rope at Whistler and punch out and you're way out into Spearhead Glacier and really remote terrain. So I think there's four specific things, four, four specific avenues of education. And then the first of course is technical knowledge and that's avalanche safety courses that I'm sure Mark and some of the others will speak to. And the Canadian Avalanche Association does a fantastic job of those specific courses. So that's essential. But it's also important to take a proper wilderness first aid course that's geared at the activity that you do. So a specific course for your activity, specifically in this instance, ski touring. Um, I think you also need technical knowledge. So a technical navigation course here on the Sea to Sky, we have um, lots of weather incidents. So a lot of uh, inclement weather. Uh, it, we get inside the ping pong ball pretty quickly where the, the ceiling drops and you're walking out in the fog for a day or two. Um, and you need to understand your gear. We've had instances with search and rescue activations and 911 activations and people severely hypothermic requiring emergency transport to hospital by helicopter 
because they just didn't take proper care of their gear and they got soaking wet. So knowing how to maintain your gear is another huge aspect of education. And the last aspect is leave no trace. Uh, like a lot of aspects, both in, in across North America, we've seen pristine alpine environments massively damaged and almost destroyed by user traffic. So why is education needed? Because the back country is not the front country. And there's four specific aspects of those aspects that I think we need to look at. And that's sports specific knowledge, wilderness first aid, technical backcountry knowledge, understanding your gear, and a leave no trace course. Thank you very much, Matt. Now uh, over to you, Mark. Uh, you for years have gained quite a respect level at the Utah Avalanche Center for the services provided to skiers and snowboarders going into the backcountry. And I think there's a pretty good knowledge of what you offer and people do pay attention to that, but it's a, it's, it's a different landscape now, isn't it? There's new people coming in and uh, how do you get them to understand they need to get this education? <laughs> you know, the, I like to think of it just where we're at right now. If you know, the, basically the first snowflakes are landing on the ground as we speak and the snowpack is just beginning to build we're all excited to get out skiing or snowboarding or snowmobiling or whatever we want to do. But if we just think about the ski areas, what's going on there right now is that ski patrols, they've been at work for a long time now. They've been doing the refreshers for their medical training. They've been out on the, you know, just as you just have a foot of snow on the ground, they've been getting uh, equipment out there. Some places might do some boot packing. They might, uh, they're, they're just paying attention to those layers as they form. They might be using some explosives. And the whole point is that, you know, push forward to maybe a month from now, everything's gonna look white. It's all gonna be snow covered. But everything within the boundaries of that ski area is totally different. That snowpack is totally different. It's been pounded. It's been, it's had explosives put on it. Snow cats have driven on it ski patrollers have put tracks in it. When you go into the backcountry, it looks the same, but none of that exists. And you essentially have to take the information we give you and become your own avalanche forecaster. If something goes wrong, just like Matt talked about, you're going to be have to, have to be your own first aid. And uh, that's no small task. These uh, ski patrols, they'll spend weeks right now uh, brushing up on all their first aid skills. And so it's totally different. If you fall and twist your knee at a ski area, they're right there with a the toboggan. They take you down. They often have uh, paramedics. They have doctors and other personnel who can provide advanced care. Uh, I know one thing they do early season is they, they get uh, landing zones established with some of the local air ambulances. So there's just a ton of work going on. And as soon as you go into the backcountry, that burden all goes onto you and there's no one else there. So that's, I think for me, the only way you can get there and to have some semblance of all this work that goes into the fall is you gotta take the, you gotta take the classes and get the education. Steve, if we go back six years ago when the tragic accident happened in Solden in January of 2015, uh, there was seemingly very little knowledge around, certainly not a lot of knowledge on the mountain that day when, when this group of athletes went off piste. Have you noticed over the last years, is there more of an understanding of the importance of education amongst ski racing clubs around the country? Um, yeah, clearly uh, we have delivered, you know, a fairly rudimentary, uh, um, you know, curriculum to thousands of uh, US ski and snowboard members and their families uh, through, um, you know, the showing of our off peace video, which I've done in many uh, uh, training camps and national projects, the uh, Brass 101 programming, the pre-pandemic we delivered in the clubs and programs, academies, and now with the, uh, you know, Brass 101 webinar platform that um, uh, we're delivering online and have had a really positive um, you know, response to. Uh, it's one of the things that I heard out at Copper from many clubs and programs, including uh, national team coaches. It, it's interesting following up on what uh, Matt and, uh, and Mark said that 
the same level of education and skill necessary to ski safely outside of the resort boundaries in North America are also necessary for skiing inside the resort boundaries in Europe every time you venture off the groomed surface. And to quote Siggy Gruner, the legendary Solden Hotelier, president of the uh, Solden Ski Club, he's an eight-time world powder eight champion, uh, enthusiastic brass supporter, he's a great guy. He said, it's not Disneyland here. And he says that with regret because his world would be much safer if it was in fact Disneyland. And that day on the rope Carl, um, we all know, uh, having read the accident report and, and, and just been there and talked to everybody that, uh, um, you know, the Americans, you know, that, that group was, was uh, you know, as I, I said in my introductory comments, they were just woefully lacking in knowledge. There was a group of Germans that skied down the rope Carl before they got there, practicing uh, safe travel ritual, descending the piece one at a time down the right side, our guys all jumped on at the same time, six of them, they brought the slope down, Ronnie and Bryce were collected, buried upside down in 12 feet of snow. And uh, Beacon's probes and shovels wouldn't make much of a difference, but education clearly would have. Um, and that is really the motivation uh, that, that, that we have for uh, getting out um, you know, this, this information uh, to, um, you know, the ski racing community. Tom. Thank you very much, Steve. I, I, I want to quantify this issue a little bit right now. And Nick, we'll go to you first uh, uh, for some metrics. And then uh, Matt and Mark will go to you to talk a little bit more subjectively about what you're seeing in the backcountry. But Nick, as you look at industry metrics over the last couple of years, what trends have you been seeing that that validates this burgeoning interest in backcountry skiing and riding? You know, we're, we're seeing a lot of trends and SIA has been in the business of, of collecting data, primarily around Alpine and snowboard products, soft goods and accessories. And you know, just, just touching on one of the comments of, of what Steve had to mention, um, and you did too, Tom, is that you know, back, back in 2015, um, a lot of this information around getting out in the snow didn't exist. And unfortunately, through these tragedies, uh, we've made some significant changes. And one of those changes on, on SIA's part is we started tracking backcountry product. We had always had it in our arsenal, but we didn't really focus on it. That changed. And so we've been, we've been tracking backcountry since um, um, fall of, of 2016. But just in the last four years, we've seen 103% increase. Um, and that's, that was before the pandemic. All right. So we track August through March. And those are, those are the big tracking months. Uh, what we saw uh, entering the pandemic were record sales for boots, shovels, packs, and skins. Alpine touring gear um, grew 34% just in the month of March. And then, uh, and that was 15% uh, for the season. Um, and we work with a, uh, uh, a research and data group called NPD. Uh, they're out of Boulder, Colorado, and they do um, everything from books to jewelry to swim, swim gear, whatever. But we focus on, on, on the product side. So just, just to break it down a little bit more, like I, I told you earlier I was going to do, um, the combined view of Alpine touring equipment, so that's defined as binding boots and skis and backcountry accessories, avalanche shovels, beacons, probes, and skins. Just from August 16 through March 20th, that's where you see the 103%. But year over year, dollars sold, uh, we surpassed $74 million. Uh, in just those product categories. When you add split boarding to, to this number, that number goes up about $5 million. So the grand total of, of AT combined and split board backcountry numbers, uh, that, that those dollars sold are 80 million. That, that is your 15% over the 69 million the year before. And again, just, just to uh, preface it and remind you, those are numbers from August um, through uh, March. 
But we take it one step further. We want to know who's doing it and we want to know why and when and how. And so we also look at participation. We recently released our first consumer insights report and the net expected change in participation uh, from last year, backcountry was up 57%. Uphill skiing was up 48%. Just to give you some reference, fat tire biking was up 48% and snowshoeing was up 57%. Cross country was up 65. But the significance to those numbers um, goes back to uh, the comment you made a little earlier, Tom, is that there are more people getting outside, getting into the backcountry, getting themselves into situations uh, where they don't belong or they don't have education. And we want to make sure everyone gets outside and has fun, but they do it in a very safe uh, and educated way. You know, I'm, I'm just curious as a follow-up to that, uh, this used to be a fairly niche category. And as we've seen over the last few years, it's growing quite rapidly. Are you seeing some of the more traditional companies in skiing getting into backcountry now because they see this interest? Absolutely. You know, um, again, you know, going back to March 16, just to give you a reference, you know, this category was only a $36 million category. You know, now we're, we're, we're right on the, right on the, on the verge of going over 80 million just in this one little category. So we're seeing a lot of, a lot of participants um, from a supplier side moving into this space. And we have to be careful around how we talk about front side, side country and back country uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and how those, those categories are represented. But at the end of the day, the manufacturer is building product to get you where you wanna go and have the, have the fun you wanna have. So again, that's where the opportunity lies. How can we educate those uh, consumers at the point of purchase? Well, thanks very much, Nick. And I know there's some interest in getting those stats. You're welcome to put them into the chat, Nick, or we can get follow up by email with the uh, attendees on the webinar tonight. Let's go to Mark and then, and then Matt. Uh, you guys are probably seeing this a little bit more subjectively because it's hard to count everybody in the backcountry. But going back to last spring when the ski areas closed and people started going into the backcountry, did you really see, or are you able to really visibly see a difference in the backcountry? Mark, why don't you start it out and then we'll go to Matt. Yeah, there's no question. When uh, mid-March rolled around, no one was ready to be done skiing and riding, that's for sure. <laughs> um, we wanted to keep getting after it. So uh, what was interesting here in Utah, uh, specifically in the central Wasatch, is uh, we had two no, uh, notable storms, one in kind of late March and one in mid-April. And uh, even the one in mid-April, we had uh, about 50 human triggered avalanches in about 48 hours. And um, those are just numbers. But if, if you were here, you would just everywhere you turned on social media, uh, videos that we people were sharing with us, it just seemed like people were triggering avalanches everywhere. And, uh, you know, one notable one was a, a really uh, fit skier. He actually gave a great presentation um, last week at the Utah Snow and Avalanche Workshop. He was on his third lap on Mount Superior. He was tracking himself on Strava. He was, uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a more interesting story. I won't pretend to tell it, but the, the really fascinating part is he ended up triggering an avalanche, getting carried all the way down Mount Superior, was uninjured, walked away from it which was that alone was amazing and uh kind of walked home with his tail between his legs but when he looked at the data from strava it had clocked him tumbling down the mountain going 77 miles an hour <laughs> which was just crazy we know avalanches go that fast but to, for him to have that on his track was something so uh, everyone was out. It, this certainly wasn't the only place. Colorado certainly saw a lot of people triggering avalanches. We've all seen the, the increase in use over the summer and rightfully so. We want to get out and the, the backcountry is the one place that has remained open. The mountains provide us solace. I, I think it's great. Uh, I certainly saw a ton of people out this summer. What I worry about is obviously avalanches are an issue, but um, the winter environment is just very, very unforgiving. So if, if we take all those people who are out 
and uh, we throw them out in winter, um, it, it, it's going to get interesting. And I, I worry a lot of people are going to get hurt. Matt, what was the scene like up in, uh, in BC? So it was, it was fascinating. We were actually watching what was happening in Utah and Colorado. It was a slightly different experience here. I think the Canadian mindset is slightly different. Um, we certainly saw a lot of people going to the backcountry, but there was a big push to, you know, hashtag chill the shred that was really pushed by a lot of everyone from pro athletes to uh, manufacturers to skiers. Everything shut down. And we actually saw a big decrease in incidents throughout sort of end of March into April and May because people really just stayed home. Um, and a lot of pro athletes stopped traveling and there was actually, um, again, perhaps because the Canadian mentality is slightly different, there was actually a lot of people stayed out of the backcountry and really were, were worried about the pandemic and really stayed home to not stress search and rescue resources. And that was sort of in March and April. So we actually saw a decrease over a typical spring in avalanche and backcountry incidents. That completely changed as soon as the lockdown was lifted. Um, we've had the busiest summer um, and I'm currently not working closely with search and rescue here in Squamish, but work with a lot of people who are. Squamish search and rescue has had the busiest summer in the history of search and rescue here in Squamish. Squamish search and rescue has done more calls than any year in history. And there was sort of a two month period with no call outs whatsoever. So we've seen a huge increase in backcountry use, not specifically in the spring, but throughout the summer and people that are woefully un unprepared like um, like I mentioned, there have been multiple calls for people who simply got up in the mountains without a jacket and ended up in hypothermic conditions. So I think everybody here certainly shares Mark's concerns. The winter is unforgiving. We've seen a massive increase throughout the summer and the same trends have continued here with ski touring purchases. We're really worried about unforgiving winters from a search and rescue perspective, from a ski patrol perspective, and from a paramedic perspective. So Matt, I'll stay with you and then we'll go on to Mark, but I, I wanna hear a little bit more about where people can get education. And I know that the system there is also stressed a little bit right now with the demand for education, uh, but Matt first and then Mark, what thoughts do you have on where skiers and snowboarders can get some education right now so that they're safer in the backcountry? Absolutely, so in Canada, now I can only speak from a Canadian perspective, um, I think there's sort of three key resources to get education from. The first here in Canada, um, we have a really great resource in the Canadian Avalanche Association, and that's actually federally funded. Um, there's been some, some issues with funding, but they have received some federal funding. Our prime minister's brother died in an avalanche, so there's a big push from a federal level to fund um, avalanches, and that can simply be found at www.avalanche.ca. Um, and there's a tremendous uh, number of resources available. There's a free online course available for backcountry, um, you know, uh, neophytes who want to get the basics. Then there's a defined process through the Canadian Avalanche Association that's explained clearly there to recreational levels and to professional levels that can be moved through as somebody moves to the industry. So that's avalanche.ca is a fantastic resource. I think the two other pieces are to take a really good wilderness first aid course. Um, you know, we run a number of two different organizations that uh, I think offer a good quality product, but any education is good education. Take a wilderness first aid or an outdoor emergency care course from a reputable organization with someone who's got real world paramedic search and rescue ski patrol training. So do your research and figure out who you're taking this training from. Ideally, I, I perhaps somewhat biased, but I think a paramedic and a ski patroller is ideally positioned to teach these courses. Some with backcountry experience and try and take a course that's tailored to your uh, backcountry use. If you are take a canoe camping focused wilderness first aid course and you're a backcountry ski tour, you're not going to get the best quality education. And then take a technical course from a certified guide. Here in Canada, the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides, it's a tremendously involved process to get certified and they're really strong professionals. I'm not a guide and I have friends who are guides. Um, I use guides in our more technical courses and also as a recreationalist there's times when I'll go skiing with a guide because I want to ski a particular objective that's sort of outside of my, my knowledge. So um, there's a, a number of different organizations there or our backcountry zenithguides.ca. Those are some fantastic resources that are here in Squamish. But I think wherever you are, do your research and look at those three pieces. Look for a good avalanche safety course. I'm sure Mark can talk about the American version of that. Take a really good first aid course from a reputable agency certified by Wilderness Medical Society, one of those other organizations, and take a technical course from a certified guide. 
Great, thanks very much, Matt. Uh, just to actually one question back to you, Matt. Uh, are these classes in high, high demand right now up in Canada? Absolutely, we're seeing a huge demand. There is, at this point, there is quite a bit of availability of guides simply because so much of heli skiing in Canada is based on international tourism. A lot of heli ski guides are, uh, are not working at their full capacity. So right now we're lucky in that there is a tremendous amount of AST or avalanche skills training education being offered. Again, the courses do fill up quickly, but we are lucky in the sense that we do have um, some training. Great, thanks very much, Matt. Mark, over to you uh, from uh, Utah Avalanche Center. I know that your Know Before You Go program has been somewhat revolutionary in providing a good entry pathway for people. What advice and counsel would you give for skiers and riders to get some education going into the season? The first thing I would say, Tom, is for anyone considering taking a class, I would sign up right now, like literally tonight because what we're seeing down here is a lot of classes are full with huge waiting lists already. So that's number one. Two is that uh, you may not get in the courses that you need. So um, we actually built this uh, online module for some free avalanche uh, awareness and education through Know Before You Go a number of years ago. Uh, it, the timing worked out pretty well. So. This is a great start. This is at uh, kbyg.org. And uh, you can go through an intro course and then five simple modules. And then there's some other videos you can watch. Overall, there's a ton of great educational content out there. You can just do a simple Google search and I imagine you'll find a ton. Uh, if you have any questions though, we have avalanche centers around the country. And the real strength that we have here in the States is that most avalanche centers grew out of kind of a grassroots, um, they had kind of a grassroots evolution and they're really tied to the local community. So if you have any questions, uh, you're looking for uh, some on snow classes, you're not sure where to turn in the virtual world, I would say go to your local avalanche center and you can find all those at avalanche.org, avalanche.org. Contact them and they will really be the ones to, to point you in the right direction and, and help you figure out what you can do. Uh, Steve Burlack from the Brass Perspective, I know you started the Brass 101 introductory program a few years ago. How has that evolved and how have you been deploying that during the pandemic? Steve, you're muted. I am not anymore. <laughs> I just saw that. Um, let me, uh, I, I want to follow up on, on, on Mark and on Matt's comments. Um, you know, before we got involved with this, you just muted me again, Tom. Am I, am I good to go? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, before, uh, we got involved with uh, avalanche education after Ronnie and Bryce were killed in Solden. It seemed like the entry level platform was RE1, and that was all that was really available uh, in the US. And uh, there was a little bit of a barrier to entry there, and that it was a three day class. It was a big commitment, and you sort of had to be a serious enthusiast uh, to get involved in it. And uh, as I started to talk, to uh, US ski and snowboard members, um, we realized that we needed a, a platform that had an easier delivery mechanism. And uh, there, uh, to Mark's point, uh, many available. One of the best out there uh, was developed by uh, Gar Trainer uh, in his team in concert with Utah Avalanche Center uh, at US ski and snowboard. Um, their e learning modules, they have a 10 minute and a 90 minute module. Uh, which is really nice. It incorporates a lot of the content that uh, was developed at, at UAC and uh, um, it's free and it's available uh, on uh, usskiandsnowboard.org. Uh, you can also link there from brassavalanche.org. Um, our programming, uh, the Brass 101 platform was uh, kind of organically developed, um, delivering it in person to groups 
of um, uh, ski and snowboard members at, at the clubs and programs. And uh, it, is a, it is a very entry level um, uh, curriculum, um, but clearly enough to help you know not to go, which uh, would have been very helpful uh, January 5th, 2015. Um, with the pandemic, we segue to the webinar platform. Um, we've had great subscription, great reviews. Um, got, as I mentioned earlier, got a lot of positive feedback when I was out at Copper for three weeks. And uh, that is being delivered by um, Avalanche uh, instructors like Lindsey Mann out of Sun Valley, who's an RE instructor and a ski coach. And you know, former Dartmouth racer, we know her very well. She does a great job. A fellow named uh, Ben Merkin is a professor at Northern Vermont University. Um, also trained avalanche uh, um, instructor who delivers it. And uh, we're real excited with how um, that has built out. And we will continue uh, to try and develop, um, you know, meaningful, easily deliverable content, um, you know, to uh, um, people who want to go out and enjoy the, uh, the backcountry. Over. Thanks, Steve. And uh, Nick, uh, on to you. Uh, you've started the program you referenced earlier, Snowbound Fest. How has that been a tool to help to reach some of the consumers who are heading into the backcountry for the first time? I said I wasn't going to mute myself after uh, Steve here, but I did. Anyway, um, we launched Snowbound Fest a few weeks ago and uh, snowboundfest.com. The, the initial um, uh, form of this was to aggregate everything winter outdoor. And as we started building out the, the wireframe, we quickly realized, and the consumers reminded us of this, is that we needed to aggregate more information around avalanche education. And I think, you know, between uh, Steve, Matt, and Mark, um, if, you, if you haven't, this hasn't sunk in, uh, these classes are filling up, if not full, and there are waiting lists. And so there's an opportunity there for us to help educate consumers. And um, majority of the people that are moving um, and, and buying product directly from a retailer are the ones that really can use the help along with um, a handful of others. But uh, we needed to aggregate, as I said, all of this information. So um, again, snowboundfest.com uh, under the about dropdown, you can find this aggregated information from American Avalanche Institute, American Institute for Avalanche Research and Education, uh, the Brass Foundation, Know Before You Go, um, Silverton Avalanche School. But then we also take it a few steps further and we have more information around avalanche um, and uh, state and forest service services. So wherever you are, um, you can go here and, and you can uh, geotarget, figure out where and what is gonna be the best resource for you uh, before you head out. We also include uh, local nonprofit avalanche centers, um, providing a lot of great information um, from Alaska down to California to Colorado um, and Oregon as well. And then uh, for those that are really looking to take it to the next level or just want to get out and, and learn uh, the basics, we also have aggregated uh, guide services. And all those guide services are under the American Mountain Guides Association. But again, you can geotarget where you are um, and figure out exactly what you would like to do um, as, a, as a way to learn and build on, the, on that education. So again, we're just trying to aggregate all this information, give you a one-stop shop uh, place to, uh, to learn, and then really uh, get out there and feel good about your choices. Uh, thanks very much, Nick. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna move now into uh, Q and A. If you have any questions for any of our panelists or just general questions overall, uh, you can use the chat function, just type your question in there or the Q and A box, or you can raise your hand and we can uh, bring you uh, into the uh, discussion. Um, panelists have provided some great information. We will follow up with uh, an email to everyone with some of these additional links and resources. I put a few of them in the chat right now. 
Uh, and Nick, thanks for, uh, thanks for sharing that information. Uh, do we have any questions from any of those attending today? Again, you can put it in the chat dialogue box or raise your hand and we'll bring you into the discussion. You know, just, uh, uh, yes, go ahead. While we wait, I might also suggest uh, my predecessor, Bruce Trimper wrote the book, Staying in Live in Avalanche Train. I don't know if anyone reads printed books anymore, but uh, that's certainly one old fashioned way to get started. It's how I got started. I just grabbed a book and uh, I was into it. And uh, certainly uh, my life depended on it. And uh, so that's one way. <laughs> So Mark, what are some of the main assumptions or errors that you see from people who are new to backcountry skiing? You know, the, the biggest thing is that you can take a class and you're ready to go. Um, it's, a, it's a years long, really it's a lifelong process. And, and most of the folks I know who are kind of uh, experts in the field who you'd think know, would know, would have all the answers about avalanches, they tend to be, they tend to be the ones who say, I have learned that I don't know a lot. <laughs> and through the years, I think a lot of folks get very, very conservative because avalanches are, are a bit spooky. You know, this is to matter, Mark, uh, I can't remember which one of you touched on this, but there was a comment earlier about wait lists. Uh, help me on this. I don't think that applies to online classes that are just, uh, online interactive uh, or is or is that's just to classes that are actually being taught is that correct matter mark um yeah well certainly the online stuff there's that's the beauty of it there's no there's not necessarily a limit to how many people can sign up so yeah it's it's really the the, the limit is on the the and the classes that are full are the on snow classes which unfortunately are really the key that's that's what you want to get into um but because you tend to have a, a, a limit on the student instructor ratio, there's just only so many people they can take out. Yeah. Here, here's one, and it was directed to Matt and Mark, but I want to bring Nick into this too. Uh, what's the possibility or what would you like to see with maybe a more concerted effort uh, between the manufacturers or distributors of equipment uh, to uh, talk more about avalanche safety? Uh, uh, actually, first, let's go to Matt and Mark, and then Nick, I'd love to get your thoughts on it from the industry association's perspective. Yeah, I can certainly uh, jump in here quickly. I think, uh, I think it's, it's been coined the Instagram effect and it's partly to manufacturers, it's partly to professional athletes. Um, the Instagram effect is people see things on Instagram and it looks easy and they think it's attainable for them, not realizing it's a professional athlete. So I think it's to manufacturers, but also to the professional athletes who make their living um, you know, doing cool things that we all want to watch. I love going to watch the, uh, you know, the, the, T the new TGR movie. And I think the new TGR movie had a really great piece on avalanche safety and equipment. And I think fantastic that um, those organizations are pushing that as well. There was an incident that happened, you know, within very close to here where there was a professional athlete who was involved in an avalanche and there were some critical gear issues that caused it to nearly be a fatal incident. Um, and it's been very well spoken about in the new TGR movie. So I would commend them. And I think that's a model for manufacturers to say, hey, um, and it's caused quite a, quite a bit of um, stuff on social media about equipment and proper equipment. So um, I think it, it falls on manufacturers and athletes to say, hey, this is a risky thing. Let's take the proper precautions and really pushing people to get proper training. And for it, it also falls to people to understand that just because you see it on Instagram or on social media doesn't mean it's attainable for you. Um, so I think that that can be a model that can be used for both manufacturers and professional athletes to say, hey, um, this is a risky, this is a risky game that we're playing. And I personally know several people who are far better skiers and more experienced than me in the mountains who've passed away in avalanches. So to Mark's point, um, I think um, the more you, people spend time in the mountains, the more conservative they become. Let's and take that. Okay, sorry. Uh, the, uh, with the question, I want to go to you, Nick, on this. Uh, with the question being, you know, is there a way that the manufacturers can band together to help uh, uh, promote this education? I know those are things that you deal with with your members as well, isn't it? It is, and uh, we're very active in that in that space, and. Uh, 
Um, really, you know, we need to get the manufacturers to come together to promote safety, promote the product, promote knowing what product. I see one of the questions uh, here, you know, what, what product outside of a shovel, beacon, and probe do you need? There's a ton of great product out there. And, uh, you know, the, the best thing that the manufacturers can do is help to educate not only the retailer, so when the consumer comes in that retail store, that retailer can help them. They've been advised by the manufacturer. They know what the gear is. They know what, how to, to, to use it and, and how it functions. And then go get some education and put it out in a practical environment. We have just a few minutes and I wanna to get to a few of these questions. So if we could just get from the panel some quick answers, but here's one, a psychological question, really. You've got a friend who's just brought this backcountry gear and they really don't see the need for education. What do you do to convince them it, it's not just about going out in the backcountry. It's about getting the right gear and learning how to use it. Anyone want to tackle that? Yes, yeah, send them a link to the off-piece video. Well, that would be a good way. That would take good. care of it. Um, Mark or Matt, any quick thoughts there? Uh, uh, what can we do to kind of break this psychological mold and get people to understand it is important to get an education? Um, hey, sorry, I was just typing an answer for somebody in here. Um, you, you know, frankly, I, I, I kind of feel like uh, we've got the right audience here. There are a lot of folks out there that you just, they, they kind of need to take a step towards us and we will meet them in the middle. I think all of us here, the guides, the manufacturers, all these foundations and associations, we are doing everything we possibly can. Um, but ultimately it, the onus really comes down to the user just to take one small step and we will meet you there. What about buying used gear? How important is it to have the latest and the greatest as far as uh, protective backcountry equipment? Buyer beware, right? Yeah. <laughs> with, with avalanche transceivers, I'd say you want one that's less than five years old. And let's see, here, here is another question. I'm gonna change this a little bit. The question is, if we wanna discover the backcountry near a ski resort front side, do we need the full gear? Uh, and it, I know it's, it's also a tough question if you're, you're gonna be uh, front side on a ski area, how essential is avalanche gear? And you know, if Mark or Matt, one of you wanna take this and in that same question, talk about the proverbial side country, if you would. I'll just say very briefly, I, last season I ski patrolled on Blackcomb and we were a transceiver and it's on and have all our gear no matter where we're skiing on the resort. So I, I think um, if you are planning to go skiing at all in the side country, which I don't love that term, but ha yes, have all the gear, absolutely. Uh, you wear your seatbelt in your car, not because you're expecting to use it, uh, but because it's a safety piece, 100%. If you're planning on um, going skiing, you should wear, you should have all the gear and you should know how to use it. And you should carry a first aid kit and know how to use that as well. I want to get one more question and, and then quickly go back to our panelists for a final uh, uh, comment. We have a question I, or, or a point. I think things need to really be dumbed down. The average skier is looking for help. There needs to be a widespread lesson of sorts. And, you know, Mark or Matt, if you could comment on this, one of the corollaries that I like to make is scuba diving. When you go scuba diving in there, there's more of a certification process, which is mandatory to get equipment, uh, but it's fairly detailed. I mean, there's a lot of steps that you need to take before you go scuba diving. Honestly, there's really not a lot different going into the backcountry. You're putting yourself at just as much risk, if not more. Mark or Matt, any thoughts on that? How do we quote unquote dumb this down or make it easier for people to understand? Well, that's, you know, I think that was the whole point of the Know Before You Go program. The, um, the original intent was to provide the content that would reach someone at the seventh or eighth grade level. And, you know, Steve is fully aware of these. We have five get the points. Uh, it's hard to say their uh, efficacy, but um, you know we've we've really drilled it down. Do you need to get the gear, get the training, get the forecast, and then there's two other steps you do when you get out in the field. That's get the picture and get out of harm's way. And if you go to know before you go, uh, kbyg.org, and go through those modules, it'll walk you through all the things you need to know about those five steps. Great. From each of our panelists, just a quick closing thought as we've reached our time limit. Mark, why don't you start it out and then we'll go to Matt, Nick, and Steve. Well, 
you know, the, I, I'd say the, the number one thing that I'd like to leave everyone with is that uh, it's really hard to, a, avalanches are really abstract for a lot of folks. Their, their power uh, is hard to appreciate until you've been in one. Snow is white and fluffy and soft and it all looks the same. So um, do everything you can to, to watch a lot of the material that's online. Uh, go through some of this education to really appreciate it because it's really easy to get kind of sucked into seeing what everyone else is doing, seeing what people are doing on social media. And you really have to just chart your, make your own path when you get out there. And that, that's the beauty of the backcountry is you get to do what you want. So don't follow anyone else, create your own path. Great, thanks, Mark. Matt? I would certainly echo everything that, uh, that Mark has said in the sense that the backcountry is, is the ultimate freedom, but there's also ultimate responsibility, that European model. So yes, if you wanna go in the backcountry, yes, have all the gear, have proper training, have first aid training, understand navigation. Um, it's a tremendously rewarding experience, um, but it is, it's high risk. And just because you've done something a lot of times and it's it, without proper gear and it hasn't ended badly for you, doesn't mean that, it'll, that it won't. So yes, take those risks, but get all the training, get an avalanche course, a first aid course, and some navigation backcountry training. And then of course, take some leave no trace training, understand how not to affect those environments negatively. So take the risks, but get the training. Great, thanks Matt. Nick Sargent? A follow up, I think uh, Matt nailed it, nailed it on the head. You know, you've got to be responsible and, uh, and do the right thing and get, get education. It's, uh, it's the right thing to do. And uh, now before you go, I mean, it says it right, right there. Um, be aware of your surroundings, have the right gear, um, have the right education and um, make smart choices. Thank you, Nick. And then finally, uh, Steve. Yeah, when, when I think of the path forward and I think of the 35,000 US Ski and Snowboard members, I think of Ronnie and his teammates and I think of the life of skiing that they represent, they are our best customers looking forward. They're going to continue to ski long after their competition careers are finished. They will raise families of skiers and will follow the same path that they did. And our mission, I think our collective mission is to provide a safety element to that life of skiing, which will broaden their horizons for more exciting and meaningful experiences on and off piste. Education provides confidence, and confidence provides freedom, and freedom supports the most satisfying life of skiing. And, uh, you know, on behalf of Brass, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. I want to thank all the other panelists for providing their expertise. Uh, this is a first, a one of a kind thing. Um, I pretty much know a lot about what's going on online and this has been amazing. So um, thanks to everyone. Well, Steve, thank you very much. And uh, final comment, Jeff Blumenfeld from the North American Snow Sports Journalist. Jeff? Yeah, this has been uh, an incredible amount of information and our members our members are going to do their best to get this information out to the general public. Thank you.